just a neuromuscular person. Um, I, along with my colleagues at Hopkins, started this Johns Hopkins Myositis, Myositis Center about 10 years ago. In 2014, I moved my lab to the NIH, so I have a lab group at the NIH, and I see some patients at the NIH, but I also continue to see patients at Hopkins at the Myositis Center. And we've seen a lot of, you know, Tom Lloyd and myself and others there, we've seen a lot of patients with inclusion body myositis. I imagine most of you or people that you know or are with have that particular disease because that's sort of the topic. Uh, today. Um, so uh, what I'd like to do is just start off by giving, you know, this is a, this session, I'm told, is supposed to be about um, inclusion body myositis and this idea that it's both an auto, potentially an autoimmune process or inflammatory process and a degenerative uh, disease and or degenerative disease. So I kind of want to just start at a, you know, th at a very basic level to just explain why it is that we have this confusion about what is at the heart of driving the disease and inclusion body myositis. I imagine in this audience we have people who may know very little about inclusion body myositis and what we know about it, and there may be people who are very sophisticated in their understanding of inclusion body myositis, and some of you may be, you know, PhDs or read papers on this, but I'm going to just start at sort of a basic level, which in a way um, is is the way to go because what we understand, what we really understand about inclusion body myositis is still at kind of a basic level. So most of what we know about muscle diseases, we learn from looking at the muscle under a microscope. So that's why you guys may have had, uh, had muscle biopsies so we can actually look at the muscle. And I just want to take you through a little bit what muscle biopsies look like and what information that provides us about inclusion body myositis. And please do, um, just interrupt me at any time uh, to ask questions if something doesn't make sense. You need more clarification. So I don't know if this uh, looks like anything in particular to you, but what this is is a muscle biopsy. So what we do when we do a muscle biopsy is we take, uh, you know, we make an incision, we cut out a piece of muscle, and the muscle is made up of fibers. And each of these fibers are individual cells. And then we cut the fibers in cross-section. And we stain them with various things. And this is the basic stain that we use when we get muscle biopsies called an H&E stain. And that's all I'm going to show you is one stain. An H&E stain stains the muscle fiber itself red. And it stains the nuclei of each of these muscle cells purple. So what you're going to see are all of these red blobs here. That's an individual muscle cell, an individual muscle fiber cut in cross-section, right? And each of these are nuclei. And the, unlike most of the cells in our body, muscle cells actually are multinucleated. So you see mo more than one purple dot in each of these muscle fibers because each one has more than one nucleus. And they're arranged, all these muscle fibers are arranged in this structure called a fascicle. So this is a single fascicle that includes, I don't know, 30 or 40 muscle fibers. Some are a lot bigger than that. And this is normal, healthy looking muscle. What you don't see what you see are that all of them are about the same size and shape. There are no inflammatory cells. There are no dying muscle cells. The muscle cells don't have any vacuoles or holes in them. This is what normal muscle looks like. Any question about normal muscle? Oh, no? OK. So now we're going to move on. This is an abnormal muscle biopsy, right? And what is abnormal about it is that you have some pretty healthy looking muscle cells here, right? So here's a muscle cell, it looks pretty good. There's some nucleus here. Here's another one, it looks pretty good. Here's another one, it looks pretty good. But surrounding these muscle fibers, you have a bunch of purple dots. And what these purple dots are the nuclei of white blood cells, or lymphocytes, okay? And those are the, um, the cells that are coming in and chewing up this muscle. You can actually see it right here. See, this is a relatively normal looking muscle fiber, but there are lymphocytes that are chewing in, right, to that muscle fiber. This is what we call invasion of a muscle fiber by lymphocytes, and we know some things. These aren't just any lymphocytes. They're special kind of lymphocytes called a CD8 positive T cell. CD8 positive is just a marker on the cell surface. You can stain for CD8 and identify those particular type, types of cells. And these cells, for whatever reason, are coming in and attacking and chewing up the muscle. This is a patient who does not have inclusion body myositis. This is from a patient who has polymyositis, okay? So we know in this case,
case that this is an autoimmune disease, if we treat this patient with corticosteroids and other immunosuppressive drugs, we're going to be able to get rid of all the lymphocytes that are in that muscle. The, pa the patient's muscle, even if it was damaged, can regenerate and regrow, and that patient can get strong again. So we're pretty good at treating patients who have muscle biopsies that look like this. Any questions about, about that? All right, pretty, pretty simple, right? Yeah. 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 So here's here's the question. So this she's telling me, look, I had a muscle biopsy, it looked exactly like that, and there and it didn't look like inclusion body myositis. So I got diagnosed with polymyositis. They did another one and it looked the same way. And, 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 and still, he was not diagnosed with inclusion body myositis because it looked like polymyositis. And so the question is, can you have inclusion body myositis and have a muscle biopsy that looks like this? And the answer is yes. About 15% of people, I think it's probably more, but probably at least 15% of people will have muscle biopsy. It, okay, this is 15% of muscle biopsies read by the world's best neuromuscular pathologist, Andy Engel at the Mayo. And he, so in the world, people probably miss it even more. But because they don't, they might not find the one little abnormality that tells you it's inclusion body mass. I said, even the world's best pathologist, 15% of the time, he's gonna say it looks like this. And based on the muscle biopsy, he won't be able to tell you whether it's inclusion body myositis or polymyositis, and most likely you'll get a polymyositis diagnosis. My guess is a third in the real world, maybe even 40% of muscle biopsies are read that this is all they see. And it's tricky, especially if you're not seeing, if you're a pathologist and you, you don't see that many myositis cases, I mean, I can understand it. So that's the typical polymyositis muscle biopsy. Now I want to show you a muscle biopsy from a different kind of patient. This is a patient who has a genetic muscle disease, okay? You'll notice that there are no inflammatory cells. This doesn't look normal because some of these fibers are kind of small, right? They're not all the same size. Some are big, some are small. It doesn't look normal. And then see these holes right here? These are called rimmed vacuoles, okay? You might have heard of those because they're also found in inclusion body myositis. But you can find these in genetic muscle diseases, and also some of those genetic muscle diseases have distal weakness, just like inclusion body myositis has. So, and we know this is not an autoimmune disease. This is caused by a, a, a gene defect in a particular gene, and we know that these rimmed vacuoles have abnormal accumulations of abnormal proteins, uh, and that and this is part of the pathologic process um, in this disease, which is called oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, or OPMD. Question back there? Oh, no, you're directing. Okay, oh, right, good. So, um, I, some, I have seen a couple people, I think at TMA a couple years ago, somebody came up to me and said, oh, I have swallowing problems, um, and I had a muscle biopsy with rim vacuoles, and I have a diagnosis of inclusion body myositis. But I examined her, and she had proximal muscle weakness, no distal weakness, and a little bit of facial, facial weakness, and she had a father who had some facial weakness and was told he had myasthenia gravis, which is another type of autoimmune disease. But really, what they had was oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, because she had, when you examined her hand, she had no finger flexor weakness at all. Um, she's also from Canada, which is where they have a lot of this. So, so oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, you have rimmed vacuoles, it's a genetic muscle disease, there's abnormal accumulations of protein. This is not, auto, not an autoimmune process at all. All right, any questions about this muscle biopsy? You guys are like experts, you guys could go read them now? Good. All right. <laughs> it's not as hard as they make it out to be. This is the classic picture of a muscle biopsy for a patient who has inclusion body myositis. And this gets to the heart of our confusion about this disease, what is, what is it? Because you look at this and you know, what do you see here? But what else do you see? Inflammation, right? So, you know, you look at this and part of you is saying, well, the, I know about rim vacuoles, I've seen these before. You find them in patients who have genetic muscle disease where there's abnormal protein accumulation, um, 
this is not an autoimmune process, right? But right next door, and this is, a, and maybe you see it right here, some invasion of a muscle fiber by, by lymphocytes, right? And, um, and often there'll be lots of inflammation in these cells, and it'll, it'll look more like the one that we saw before, like your, like your muscle biopsy did. And this really gets to the, you know, to the crux of the problem. In a way, this is really all we understand, right? We understand that when we look at these muscle biopsies, there are classic features of degenerative muscle disease, in many cases caused by a genetic mutation that causes abnormal accumulations of these proteins. And at the same time, we see these inflammatory cells, which we see in patients who have autoimmune muscle disease, and we never see in those patients who have oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy or the other uh, dystrophies that have rim vacuoles. So just looking at the muscle biopsy, you are confused. What, what is this? It looks like it's a combination, a combination of things. And as a physician, when you see all of that inflammation on a muscle biopsy, you really, really feel like you ought to be treating the patient with corticosteroids and other immunosuppressive agents because you really feel like you should be able to make patients better by treating that underlying inflammation, and yet it doesn't work. Um, as far as we know, no one's ever been able to prove it works, and there's some evidence that it might actually make some people worse. So, um, and there's some other, um, you know, evidence for these various things, right? So first, you know, on the degeneration side, we know that in patients with inclusion body myositis, that the vacuoles contain these abnormally folded proteins. We don't need to get into, I think, the details of exactly what they are. There's lots of different ones, but there's abnormally folded proteins. And we don't know, um, actually, whether those rimmed vacuoles are causing muscle damage or whether that's the result of the, of the cell trying to compensate for some other process that's going on. We don't know whether those are, are adaptive or maladaptive inclusions. You know, we don't know if making the rimmed vacuoles go away would actually make people worse. We, have, we don't know that. The other thing is some patients who look for all the world to us like they have sporadic inclusion body myositis. I've seen at least two who their muscle biopsies look like inclusion body myositis. And um, when I physically examined them, they looked, they had the classic sort of IBM pattern of weakness. And yet, people like Chris Weil, who's here today, have shown that some of those patients actually have genetic mutations that are, that are probably causing their, their disease. But that's just a small, tiny minority, right, of, of patients who have those. And the other thing that tells us that this is, you know, that suggests to us maybe this really is a degenerative process as opposed to an autoimmune process is that patients in general, and I know there are exceptions and maybe there's variability, but in general people don't respond, or at least they're not cured, right, by immunosuppressive medication. Yeah. How do you find out about mutations? Did they have the genetic? Yeah, so, so various groups have taken, um, have taken DNA samples from inclusion body myositis patients. In fact, Chris Weil went to um, to one of the TMA meetings, I think, a couple of years ago, and got a bunch of DNA from you guys, um, probably some of you contributed to this, and they did whole genome sequencing, and sequenced every gene and looked for uh, looked for mutations, and there's a small percentage who had this BCP mutation. I forget exactly what it was, maybe one or two out of 100, but it's known that that can cause abnormal uh, protein folding and probably is causing the, causing the disease. Because they say for sporadic IBM, that is not recommended genetic testing. Right? Yeah, for sporadic, for sporadic IBM, gen, gen, that's right, gen, genetic testing is not recommended in part because even if it's a genetic thing, we still don't have, it doesn't actually change what we're going to do. Um, and and even if we get it done, it's not really going to uh, There are exceptions to that, so there are some there, uh, if you look like you have sporadic inclusion body myositis, there's usually no need currently for genetic testing. You might participate in genetic testing as part of a, a study, but as for routine clinical diagnosis, it's not necessary. Yeah. Nothing can be done about the BCP. There are other, um, the reason, one of the reasons to know is because there are clinical trials. So there's another disease that has rib vacuoles called hereditary inclusion myopathy due to a g defect in this gene called GNE. And there are, for example, trials going on for how to treat that. This is very different than inclusion body myositis. In fact, in fact you can tell because um, I've seen patients who are misdiagnosed, misdiagnosed with inclusion body myositis because on their muscle biopsy they have the rim vacuoles. But instead of like an inclusion body myositis where their quadriceps are weak and the hamstrings are spared, theirs is the reverse. 
hamstrings totally gone, quadriceps look perfect. So, the, so this is some of the reasons, sort of the rationale for thinking, oh, this is like a degenerative process. But now, we also have this additional evidence, in addition to just the muscle biopsies, that there's, that there's probably an autoimmune component to this disease. Steve Greenberg, who many of you might have seen at past TMA meetings, has been a real leader in this. And it turns out that there are these very, there's this very aggressive population of T cells that are found in patients with inclusion of body myositis these super aggressive um, inflammatory T cells that are found not just in the muscle but also circulating in the, in the blood of patients. And they're very hard to get rid of, if, if it's even possible at all, with, uh, with immunosuppressive therapies that we currently have. Um, and the other thing is Steve and another group um, in Europe has identified that patients with inclusion body myositis have autoantibodies, these NT5C1A autoantibodies, which are sometimes useful for diagnostic purposes. And autoantibodies are one of the sort of key features of, um, of an autoimmune process, where you're making antibodies not against bacteria or viruses or things that you really want to get rid of, but instead you're making autoantibodies against your own cell proteins. In this case, that NT5C1A uh, protein is found mostly in muscle. So that's, we think, what, one of the reasons why it's targeted. So, so the pinch, so it's not so simple, right? There's evidence for both things, and the pinch kind of swings back and forth in terms of what we think might be the predominant problem. The T cell, does that put it more in the world of cancers? Oh, well, that's a great question. You know, does, the, does this really aggressive T cell uh, population put it in the world of cancers? And the answer is maybe. So. Um, some patients with, with sporadic inclusion body, body myositis fulfill criteria for this type of cancer called uh, large T cell granulocytic uh, LGLL. I was getting wrong. Large granular lymphocytic leukemia, uh, which is a T LGL. Let's call it that. Um, and uh, and that disease is characterized by populations of these CD57 positive cells that have a particular morphology. Um, you know, they look a particular way under the microscope, and, and, and Steve has shown that those types of cells are actually in the muscle of patients with inclusion of body myositis. But what we don't know, but it's unclear whether, uh, whether that develops as a consequence of having IBM, you know, that those cells are just stimulated, 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 until, be, until they become abnormal or whether you develop a population of aggressive abnormal T cells that then decide to go after the muscle. So we don't know which, which, which way it's going. Yeah, but that, so the answer is yes. In Steve, in, in Steve Greenberg's <coughs> cohort, it's about 60%, I believe, of his patients fit into that category of having enough of these cells that they actually make, they fit that diagnosis. And about 30% in 58%, I'm close. Um, uh, good enough for government work, as they say. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in other cohorts, it might be smaller. But, but, um, but we see some people who, tr we do see, I've seen a couple of patients, though, I have to say, who truly do have T large, T LGL. And I say they, when I say they really have it, I mean they don't just have IBM, they have other manifestations of the disease where, for example, their white blood cell population is being attacked, or they have other organ system involvement. But most IBM patients, even the ones who fulfill the criteria, do not have these other disease manifestations. So, you know, this is only figured out in the last year or two, so we're just trying to figure that out. And, I mean, we were at the general group. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the question is, you know, uh, are there different subtypes of inclusion body myositis? Okay, if some of these people do fit into that category and others don't, could, could there be different subtypes of inclusion body myositis? <clears throat> My guess is probably yes, right? So we do, you know, we, there are some unique populations. So let me just throw something out there that I find kind of fascinating. In Japan, right? You'll, maybe you know the exact number. I'm going to make up a number. About 50%, 60%, I don't know, 58% of um, patients, a, a significant amount of their inclusion body myositis patients have hepatitis C. 
Twenty-six percent. It's a lot. It's forty. Yeah. 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 So there's this increased prevalence of of hepatitis C. I'm glad I have an expert. It always helps to have an expert. Um, there's, there's a significant population of patients in Japan. I want to say it's more than that, but we can talk. Yeah. But we can, someone can look it up now we have the internet. There's a significant number of patients in Japan where hepatitis seems to really be associated with this. In the United States, what we see is not a huge population, but we see some patients with HIV. Who, who get HIV infected in their 20s, 30s, and then by the time, either right away or a decade later, but still young, develop inclusion body myositis, right? So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe all of us have some kind of viral trigger for it, and it just varies. Maybe it depends on which country you're, you're in, or maybe some people have a viral trigger and some people don't. But, there, but, but uh, I take your point that there are probably different ways to trigger it, whether the different triggers cause different types of disease or whether for some people it's genetic. Uh, we're, we're trying to figure that out. Those, those are great questions. One more question? One more. No, it's okay. Uh, those are good questions. Hopkins, well, I thought the idea of like what you said with Japan is looking at different countries and seeing are there Yeah, so, uh, I mean, we're, the Hopkins group, to the best of my knowledge, we're not doing anything trying to look at the epidemiology. I mean, to do epidemiology, you need to look beyond your own little center. That, you know, the best places to do that are countries where they keep, like, where, where all of the health insurance stuff is available in, like, one big database, and you can just fig figure this out. So Sweden, those places are good, good places. England, good places to do this kind of, kind of research. Um, yeah? Should we watch out? So we don't know. So literally, this. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. That would be the question. Should if I have IBM, should I be worried that I could develop LDL? Is that that's the heart of the question? I think. And the answer is we don't know yet. Um, we're really just trying to figure this out. So we're just ramping up the testing to do to look for it is not something that, that our lab usually does. So to really do it right, we're, de we're having to develop the assay to do it. Um, I know the group at Irvine has their assay up and running, and maybe you contributed to um, Tassin Mozafar's blood collection. My understanding is that he's using that blood, and he's going to run it doing flow cytometry to look for these markers to see how many of you guys actually have this. So, so ask Tap to see next year, out of the 48 people I think he took blood from, you know, what percentage of, uh, of the group has it. But even that, uh, even if you have it by that criteria, it doesn't mean that, that you have um, a cancer that needs to be treated or that's going to be respond to treatment. And whether, we don't know yet whether people who have like low grade LGL are going to, to, to develop it. And I gotta say, I mean, I followed a lot of inclusion body myositis patients over the last decade, and I haven't really seen anybody, you know, this is just anecdotal, right? But I haven't seen anybody go on to develop it. People don't get neutropenia, and, you know, which is low white blood cells and things like that. So I, I, my gut instinct is that it's low on the list of concerns, but, you know, stay tuned as we get more information. So can I summarize the session so far? Yeah. You, you, you don't know anything? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. That's right. I hope, and I hope I've explained why I'm confused. Yeah. Uh, you've been doing this for about 15 years? Something like that. Less. Less. 2005 is probably when I saw my first IBM muscle biopsy. You do go to the office every day, right? Uh, well, I have a couple offices, but yeah. yeah. Uh, seriously speaking. Uh, and I know that is there an equivalent to you or your center in Australia? Because I know Australia uh, Okay, has, uh, so Australia has some very good, the question is, is there something in Australia to go to? There are groups in Australia that um, that see lots of patients with, with myositis, and they have a big registry of myositis patients in Australia, and um, your kid, I'll have to look up the names of the people. One, uh, uh, I'm just forgetting, their, I'm terrible with names, I forgot their names, but the answer is yes, there's definitely at least one group in Australia and it's a continent, or so, but in that in Australia, who do who are experts? Yeah, the reason uh, I yeah. ask is because yeah. we did a mini conference in Miami. You know, with Dr. Yeah. Asherman, and it was brought up that Australia had a almost you know three times the rate of IBM that we have in the USA. Yeah. So I was wondering if any 
research data has drawn back. So, you know, the question is about do, are we working with the Australians in any way to try to understand inclusion body myocytes? But I, unfortunately, I would say the answer is, is no. I mean, we, uh, I think we learn from each other, we read each other's papers and things like that, but we haven't, you know, for one thing, there are lots of things that would be interesting to do. Like, we could sit down with 40 muscle biopsies of the IBM patients from the United States and look at 40 muscle biopsies from patients with Australians, see are they the same or different? Nobody's really done that. You know, so we, and I don't go to Australia and examine their patients, and they don't come here and examine mine, so we don't know for sure if they're exactly the same or not. There's some funny things when I read their papers. I'm like, are you sure those patients had IBM? Um, but, <laughs> question? The Australian group believes in autoantibodies. I mean, I can't speak to NT5C1A, but they, they work on autoantibodies, for sure. Can I ask a question about the NT5C1A? Please, ask a question about NT5C1A. Could that antibody autoantibody show up before someone shows So the question is, could you have an anti-NT5C1A autoantibody show up before you develop muscle symptoms? And the answer is yes, again, quoting this famous Steve Reber paper, he had one patient who came to his clinic who had high CK levels, um, and Steve Freeberg saw them, and I believe had no weakness. He did, worked up, didn't know what they had, but collected their blood, right? Banked it away. And then years later, he discovers NT5C1A. He goes back and screens all the blood samples he has, and that guy who showed up years earlier before he had any symptoms except for the elevated blood enzymes had NT5C1A autoantibodies. So the answer is maybe the antibodies show up before you develop the disease. The reason I ask is because my mother has myositis. Okay, so she's yeah. so she's saying her your her your mother had myositis and died died with myositis and um, so if you so I have to say this I mean I don't know the first yeah the family went through muscular dystrophy yeah. So um, anytime more than one person in a family is diagnosed with myositis, my, my like, whether it's inclusion body myositis, sporadic inclusion body myositis, or dermato, or polymyositis, my radar is up, like, um, it is genetic until proven otherwise. And so the, te the genetic testing that we have today to diagnose patients with genetic muscle disease is light years ahead of what it was three years ago. You know, so now, you know, when we bring people into the NIH, we're not just doing whole exo. You know, probably looking for muscular dystrophy five or ten years ago meant looking at ten or twenty different genes, right? Uh, five years ago, it meant that you would look at twenty thousand genes, doing whole exome sequencing, but you'd just be looking at the small part of the genome that's the exome. Now we do whole genome sequencing on patients, and we find that there are mutations outside of even the exons. That, co that can cause dystrophies. So, so the so uh, so a lot of so there there's a lot of progress being made looking at families now, um, where they're able to identify causative mutations that wouldn't have been picked up even a few years ago, and can't be done clinically. It's like strictly research labs that do it. So, uh, so the nt 5 c one a okay, let's open that bag of worms. That's a whole bag of worms, okay? So nt 5 c one a here, I'll have a few things to say about it. One is 58% or whatever of, uh, of patients with IBM have it. Very few patients with polymyositis have it, but not zero, right? There is a false positive rate for that test, and I don't know exactly what it is. It probably depends on the test. I guess it's probably at least 1%. I can tell you, um, when I tested, we developed our own assay for NT5C1A, and we found that 5% of healthy adults had, had, had anti-NT5C1A autoantibodies. When we tested kids, it was 10% of the, of the pediatric population had it. Now, and, and the other thing is, it's not specific for IBM. When we tested patients who have dermatomyositis, about 20-some percent of them had it, and Ingrid Lundberg's group in, in Sweden has found the same thing. And lupus patients also have it, even those without any muscle disease. Sjogren's patients, some of them have it. Um, uh, so it's not a IBM-specific antibody. It's not a myositis-specific antibody. 
It doesn't mean it's not important, and it can be useful if you have it to tell you that you probably have IBM and not polymyositis, but you have to look at the whole picture, and you cannot rely on that one test to tell you that. The other thing is, it, it may be telling you, even if it's not useful diagnostically, you know, to see Mozavar has shown that people with that antibody have more severe disease, right? I, adults with inclusion of myositis have, have more severe disease. It's associated with higher mortality. We have an unpublished study where we looked at nt 5 c one in the pediatric juvenile myositis population. And uh, I, to I taught, presented this data at our, our myositis uh, advisory board scientific symposium yesterday. And what we found is 27%, this number I know exactly, 27% of the pediatric population of myositis <coughs> patients have the antibody and is associated with more severe juvenile myositis. So it probably is telling us something about the uh, how revved up the, auto, the autoimmune system is. And it may be telling you something special about IBM, but I don't think it's a magic uh, answer to, to what's causing the disease. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. The front row, Al, is yeah, good on the question. Yeah. Can this specific antibody be used to, to treat treatment? Yeah, so the question is, could we somehow target, get rid of, if we got rid of the nt 5 c one autoantibody, would, would the disease get better? Nobody knows the answer to that. Well, I can tell you what I think, but I don't know. I would think not, but I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, question. So if I heard you right, if, if a father has IV and he has passed away and the daughter has DM, that would be something that you'd be interested in knowing about? Yes. In fact, there's a study at the NIH that twin, so uh, if, if you have multiple, look, you should email me, and I can put you in touch with the right people, but we're very interested in where there, where there are families. There may actually be families where more than one person has dermatomyositis, but we'd like to study those people, for sure, because it's super rare, and in that case, you know, it may be helpful to tell somebody about what's going on with the rest of the population. So another question, is there any chance is there any chance it's environmental? I would say yes. And when I mean what I mean by environmental is uh, my for most uh, acquired diseases and autoimmune diseases, usually you're born with some genetic predisposition to having it, right? You're at an increased risk, and some other things have to happen for you to actually develop the disease. It could be a viral infection that triggers it, and you're more susceptible to it. It may be it's a viral infection plus something else. You know, so we have patients. I study another group of patients who develop a very severe form of autoimmune muscle disease after they've been exposed to statins, right? And they develop antibodies to to HMG reductase, which is the target of the statin medications. Um, so those, and they have a certain genetic predisposition to doing it. Not they all have this, or seventy percent of them have a have a certain mutation that's only found in about five percent of the general population. So they have a genetic predisposition. They get the right exposure, and then they get it. But what I would say, and, and the other thing that tells me that in these diseases you know, there's a there's a environmental trigger. I've got um, identical twins, right? Where one of them has flora dermatomyositis, and the other's totally fine. They have the same genetic background, right? But one of them probably got exposed to, to something else. <clears throat> yeah? What are the chances that somebody could live 10 years a mile from each other and, and uh, no relationship uh, other than friends and both have IBM and DM? So what are the chances that one, that two people living 10 miles, within 10 miles, one would have DM and would have IBM? No. I, my family, one mile. I have IBM yeah. and this other family, good friends of ours, they, they're the ones that have IBM and DM. So, uh, you know, whenever we, so, you know, the question is about, like, uh, can people, is it weird that people living in the same area that there'd be, like, a high prevalence of myositis? I think it, in some cases it might be providing a clue. We don't know what it is. The world's uh, capital for um, myositis, I was told, at TMA meeting by somebody who looked into this, is Tacoma, Washington, right? I didn't know this. I grew up in Seattle. I didn't know this. 
the, but and, and again, th th this, this is all with a grain of salt. This is not my doctor. I take my doctor up. I don't know when this is true. But when I was growing up, we all joked about Tacoma because when you drove past it, you could smell it. It was called the aroma of Tacoma. And it was because they had these fabulous paper mills, right? And so there were these paper mills that would churn out this stuff. And you could just smell Tacoma for miles away on the freeway on I-5 as you drove down past it. And I always went, and in my immediate thought was, oh man, it must be these paper mills, you know, that drive, but who, but who knows what it is. But the answer is yes, there are pockets where myositis seems to be more or, more or less um, common, and, and nobody really knows why it is. Yeah. Question? Could we move the agenda for the next slide, please? Well, there's only one more slide, so I wouldn't get too excited. Sure. Okay. So, um, uh, and I know how these conferences go, so I only put in a few slides. And mostly I'm here to answer questions. That's really what it's about. Please, go ahead. Yeah. What is the thought why it's more prevalent in males than females? Why is it more prevalent in males than females? I do not know. Nobody knows the answer to that. Most autoimmune disease, that, I could have put that up on the previous slide, right? Most autoimmune diseases are much more common in women than men. So in our dermatomyositis, it's about 70%, 75% women. IBM, it's the other way around. So is that, you know, I can't think right off the top of my head, maybe ankylosing spondylitis is the only other autoimmune disease where I can think that more men than women are affected. It's mostly the other way around. So that's something in the column for this is a degenerative disease. Another question. I suffer with pain, and I have for years. I wonder how many people in here deal with pain because of IBM. Oh, this is a great question. So uh, if you have... Uh, how, so how many people have IBM? Okay, keep, keep your hands up if pain has been a problem for you. So it's it's a bit of half. Do you have any idea why? No, no, I don't. So I have some people who um, I have a, I I don't know why some people have pain and other people don't. It gets back to the question about subtypes. You know, maybe there's different subtypes. But for some people, pain is just zero problem. You know, they're like, oh, this is just painless weakness. I have other people where. That is their major problem, is the pain that's associated. And they can feel their muscles um, and the damage that's going on in their muscles. Yeah, so we don't know the answer. Is it all over the pain? Is it all over the body? I find that they, the, the question is, is the pain all over the body? And um, you'd have to ask them, but my, it, my gut is that they're usually pointing to the affected muscles. When people are telling you about their pain of IBM, they're pointing to their quadriceps and saying, this is where I have it. But it, it they may have it elsewhere. I don't think anybody's really cataloged that in any, in any way where I could be more precise about it. Question? Um, in terms of pain, I have been feeling of pain in my joints, and my rheumatologist thought it might have been RA. And I was wondering if there's any research to show what percentage of IBM patients have RA. Yeah, so the question is, how, you know, what percentage of, of IBM patients have RA? I don't know the answer to that. It's a small percentage. I would guess it's less than 5% of IBM patients have RA also. But we have, we do have people who have bona fide RA and inclusion body myositis. We have more who have a disease that's called Sjogren's syndrome who also develop inclusion body myositis. And we don't know why that is. It's interesting that both of those diseases independently have anti-NT5 C1A autoantibodies. Maybe that's a clue. But I don't know. I will get to this slide because, um, and then we could just go on talking about about IBM. So, so given what I told you, so I told you that um, there's evidence that this is a degenerative disease. There's evidence that this is an autoimmune disease. Now let's sort of look at what if some of the potential treatments are. So, it were the basically the strategies. Okay. So one strategy would be let's prevent prevent or improve abnormal protein folding and accumulation in the muscle, right? Let's, let's prevent the process that's leading to those rimmed vacuoles that we saw in the muscle. And aramoclamol is one such drug. That's the one that, uh, that uh, Mazen Damachki is working on at KU. We talked about it. You, you, I got to tell you guys, everybody like looks at him as giving him a hard time. Let me say this. You just have no idea how hard it is to do a trial like that. It's unbelievable. Every single step of that process is incredible. He was telling you just about one step, which was just getting the drug to the United States. And it's not made in the United States. It's made elsewhere. 
and you have to hire like a consulting company, like, is it France? I can't remember where it is, and another one in the United States, and you gotta get all of the paperwork done exactly right the first time, otherwise it will wind up in customs forever, just stuck there. And, and so every little thing, if you don't do it exactly right, could shut down the whole thing. Just an un the, the regulation is unbelievable. So when I look, when you know, I, I am just amazed at the effort that he's gone through to, to get it where it is. And, and I don't know if you guys, you guys probably heard this, they've started, you know, they've got the first patient treated, so it's really an incredible effort. Um, but that's one, that's a drug that the idea behind it is that it's going to improve the protein folding and hopefully lead to, uh, to less rapid or maybe improved uh, muscle function. The other thing would be, you know, immunosuppression. Right, let's go after the autoimmune component of this. Let, this is, there's, if there's autoantibodies and this aggressive T cell population, let's wipe that out. So one would be the traditional drugs like steroids, methotrexate, things like that. And, and so far we haven't been convinced that any of that works. But maybe we're not actually using the right drugs. Or maybe we need to use a more powerful combination of drugs. Or maybe we need to go at, we need to develop new drugs for inclusion body myositis that are specifically designed to go after that autoaggressive population of T cells. And I think that's a really promising area. Figure out something that's special about the just the cells that are the bad players in inclusion body myositis and go after those. And so people are going to be working on that. Yeah. Okay, so the uh, designation of that particular T cell is CD57. That's market. right. It's, it's really about a stain response. Well, no, there are other markers for it. So I'm just so it is um, it is a specific population, and it and it the, in in the in T large in T LGL, there are actually different populations that can vary by patient. Some patients have a nat natural killer cells that have different markers that are the aggressive ones. But there are, there are things that they do have and things that they don't have on their surface that you can look for to identify them. And then are they, so, so the designation is one thing, and then did, are they uh, commonly found in other certain uh, immune processes? Or are they fairly unique to IBM? So the question is, are these CD57 positive cells unique to IBM? Great question. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I know, um, uh, we haven't looked for, you know, Skeeves looked for them in, in some populations of patients, but I don't think we've looked at them in all the populations that would be of interest. Yeah, but the point is, like, let's not get rid of all the immune cells and make people immunosuppressed and all this. Let's just get rid of the bad players. You know, so that'd be, that'd be another strategy. Another thing, another strategy is, well, Okay, so some of the muscles, muscles are getting, you know, damaged by the inflammatory response maybe, other ones are being degenerated, but still many people have a lot of muscle fibers that are actually still pretty functional, right? They're not totally gone yet. So let's make those muscles as strong as they possibly can be. Let's get them as big as they can be, as strong as they can be. And so a, a drug like the Megramab, right, which was the Novartis drug, that drug is designed to do exactly that, make muscles hyper, hypertrophic, as strong as possible, right? And, um, and so those, I think, fit from, you know, those are really the three main therapies. It's not really more complicated than that, I think, the, the details of it. And what I would say is, in my personal opinion, uh, when the effective treatments for inclusion of body myositis until we really understand what is driving the disease at, at the real heart of it, which we don't, I think, know, it's, maybe it's going to involve all three of these together in some combination. Think about cancer. You don't treat cancer with one drug. You know, you can't treat cancer with one drug. You treat it with multiple drugs. They're attacking, you know, multiple different parts of the of the of the process that's driving the immune system, or sorry, that's driving the malignancy, and I think it could be the same thing, you know, in inclusion body myositis, that we're going to need to combine aramacromol and uh, an anti CD fifty seven drug and famigramab or something like it. Combine these things to really effectively make patients better. Maybe I'm wrong, you know, maybe we'll come up with the one magic bullet, but I would also be thinking like, let's do trials where we where we give people aramacromol and bimacromab, you know, like why why not do that? You know, why, you know, it's hard to do these things, but um, but that I think it may be 
maybe where this is eventually headed. Like if you can show that you get a little, let's say we got a little bit with the migramab, right? And we got a little bit with aramopramol. Maybe if you put those two things together, it's more than just an additive effect. You know, who knows? It's that way with cancer drugs anyway. So, you know, that is really all, that's my last slide, um, I think. So um, that's really all, my, my, that is what I know about it. But I'm happy to, let me take your questions if you have an answer. So on immune suppression, how do you measure the success of the treatment by a, a person's um, perceived weakness or degradation of that by the CK down and it going up and down? Yeah. How do you measure success? So the question is, how if you're going to try immunosuppressive medications for inclusion of body myocytes, how do you decide whether it's working or not? And I do this, and I would say you cannot use what people, it's like uh, subjective measures, it's not very good, because something like corticosteroids give people a lot of energy, it can give them revved up, they can feel like they have more energy, and they may actually be doing more, but it doesn't mean their muscles are any stronger, it may not have any effect on their, on their muscles. The CK level, also not a good marker. Corticosteroids will make everybody's CK go down, and it has no correlation with muscle strength and inclusion of body myocytes. Same like in a dystrophy, I can give, you know, if you have fast, if you have oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy, I can give you steroids and make your CK go down, but that's not actually doing you any, any good. So what I do, if I'm going to put somebody on immunosuppression with they have inclusion body myositis, is I do quantitative muscle strength testing. I put them on treatment and I do subsequent quantitative muscle strength testing. Uh, it's obviously working if they get it stronger, right? Um, the question is, you don't really know what they would have done if you hadn't put them on it. Like, is it slowing it down? That's harder. That, that's more sophisticated. But I can figure out whether it's actually making you stronger or not. And, and I, think, I think that's how you ought to do it. I mean, I carry around my own personal like strengthometer, and I, I can measure what people's strength is, so that's how I do it. And when I talk to people who don't have that, uh, haven't learned how to do that, and don't have the machinery, I would say most like physical therapists will have that machinery. So you can go, you can get a physical therapy assessment. They can do quantitative muscle strength testing on you. You can go on the drug. You can you can then be on it for whatever predetermined length of time. Retest the muscles, and usually I'll then make people go off. The treatment to see whether they, you know, whether that really did anything or not, and it's a trial and error process. I have very few patients where I'm convinced that that the, that the steroids or any other medications are doing something, but I have patients who are very convinced they are, and I can't prove that they're wrong. That they're wrong, and I have made mistakes before where they were definitely did. So I have, you know, I have one patient who came to me. And he looked like he had inclusion body myocytes. Absolutely for sure. And the he looked like a classic inclusion, inclusion body myocytes patient. He came to me, he was on prednisone, azathioprine, methotrexate. Um, and I said, man, you got to get off of all these medications. And I just took them off, took them all off. And his CK went from like 400 to 5,000. He started falling. I brought him back to the clinic. He was way weaker. But his weakness wasn't in the IBM muscles. When he got, where he got weaker were his like deltoids and hip flexors, the ones that, that mostly get weak in people with autoimmune muscle disease. So I put him back on all his immunosuppression, and he went back to looking like he just had IBM, right? So, and he kept doing, he keeps doing this. He probably has both, right? Inclusion body myositis and an autoimmune myositis going on at the same time. Super rare. But like I do keep that in the back of my mind. So if I see somebody in my clinic who has too much proximal muscle weakness than I would expect, those are the patients who I would say, maybe you try giving them immunosuppression. And if I can see that their deltoids are getting stronger, great. But what I never have seen is the underlying inclusion body myositis stuff. I've never been, I can't say it doesn't happen, but I've never been really been 100% convinced about it. So that raised a lot of hands. Okay. <laughs> back in the back, you haven't had some question yet. Yeah, the question I had was, when you make the muscle fiber stronger, yeah, um, does that make it? First question is, does that make it less susceptible to the, the aggressive T cells? If you make a muscle fiber larger, does it make it less like susceptible to the to the inflammatory component? Uh, nobody knows the answer to that. 
I don't I don't know whether it makes it more or less. I don't have no I never even thought about it. My guess would be it's just as susceptible as it was, but I don't know whether a hypertrophy muscle fiber is going to be protected or more vulnerable. I don't know. Okay, so the second question you yeah. may not know. Um, is, is, uh, They're good questions. That's how I can think of the next experiment to do. No, is is uh, well, and this is confusion I've had because of the because of the conflicting information there was about exercise. Yeah. And so when so, so is an invaded uh, muscle fiber as you were showing in yeah. the slides. Um, are those repairable, or are those going to die anyway and be replaced by other muscles? The muscle fibers? Yes. Okay. The question is, are the damaged muscle fibers repairable? In, I would, okay, what I can tell you is this. If you look at muscle biopsies from patients who have inclusion body myositis, you can find muscle fibers that are healthy, muscle fibers that are undergoing damage, either because they have rib vacuoles or because they have inflammatory cells around them. You also see regenerating muscle fibers in there. Okay? So there is regeneration going on in the in, in IBM just like in other muscle diseases. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's the first time I've heard that. Yeah. Question. Yeah, so the question is, can you use MRI to assess what's going on in the muscles, either as natural history or after you've had an intervention? And the answer is yes, you can. The techniques are being developed that are actually really highly quantitative at looking at muscle by MRI. You do not need contrast. It can be a no contrast MRI. Um, and you can see, from a, from a simple-minded point of view, you can see two, uh, maybe I have this, hold on for a second, I can, I can show you afterwards. There are two things you can see on the muscle MRI that are really important. One is you can see how much, three things. You can see how much healthy muscle there is. You see all the healthy muscles. You can see fat. You can see how much of the muscle has been replaced by fat. And you can also see of the muscle that's there, how, whether it's being damaged whether there's edema or inflammation in the muscle. So it does allow you to say how much muscle is left, how much has been damaged and is not going to come back, and how active is the process going on that's, that's damaging it. And yes, you can look serially to see, to look at changes. So I don't know if six months is the right, the right amount of time, like how much change you would see. But yes, MRI is actually being developed as a primary tool to assess how people are responding because you can look to see has the muscle atrophied and, or is it is it getting bigger and things like that. So that's an active thing. So do you see this becoming more of a tool in the future? It, 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 so in Europe, it is a part of the diagnosis of muscle disease. They do MRIs all the time. We do MRIs on our patients all the time. We do follow-up MRIs on them. So I think of MRI as part of it. If there's no reason outside of a research protocol to MRI inclusion body myositis patients uh, more than once usually, unless there's some question that arises that you're trying to answer with the MRI. So usually I'm MRIing people a second time if there's a question that I am trying to answer, which doesn't come up all that often in an untreated IBM. Yes? One of the ways that Dr. Jerry Mandel finds out if, how much progress is taking place is one of many. Yes. In the Benegra map trial, they used MRI also. Yeah. Question back there and back there and ask questions. Is there any evidence of cardiac or smooth muscle involvement? Yeah, is there any evidence of cardiac or smooth muscle involvement in IBM? Um, not, so smooth muscle, I would say no. Cardiac, rarely, if ever. I think there, there's really not any. There's really not any that we know of. But I wouldn't, but I don't think anyone's taken a hundred inclusion body myositis patients and done like cardiac MRI, which is what you'd have to do to look at the cardiac muscle. So I don't think anyone's really excluded the possibility. But we don't think that's a bit, if it's, if it's there and it may not be there at all, it doesn't seem to be a thing to worry about as far as we can tell. Question? It's a dead question. What yeah. happens to the muscle that's breaking down so much that it eventually affects your liver? Or uh, 
So the question is, is the muscle breakdown damaging you in any way? Not just your muscles, but other organs. So some of you might have heard, boy, if you have like an extreme amount of muscle damage, like rhabdomyolysis is one term for this, that the kidneys can be damaged, right? Because when the muscle cells break open, there's so much protein that's released in the bloodstream that the kidneys get clogged up by the protein. You can have kidney failure. And we see that, but never in IBM. In fact, kids with this, this will make you feel better. Well, it actually won't make you feel better in general. But kids with muscular dystrophy, like the Duchenne muscular dystrophy, walk or walk and then don't walk with ZKs of 40,000, and they never develop kidney problems. So, yeah. So you do, you do not have to worry about kidney problems with high CK levels or from the muscle damage. Other other questions? Yeah, let me, I'm going to take your question. Sorry. My actually showed I had regenerating muscle, yep. but it also showed denervation. Ah, yeah. So, de so what is this about denervation in the muscle biopsy? So, in inclusion body myositis, in, I, I didn't even bring this up because it's just going to make it even more complicated. I'm right? curious. She had evidence of denervation on the muscle biopsy. That is not uncommon in patients with having, who have inclusion body myositis. That you see evidence in the muscle biopsy, not just of muscle damage, but also the secondary effects of nerve damage to that muscle. And we think that there is an increased risk of neuropathy in patients who have inclusion body myositis. We don't understand it very well. Um, but that's one reason why if you have a neuropathy, you could have denervation. Also, it depends like what muscle, I don't know what muscle you have biopsy, maybe a quadricep. Oh, right bicep. So if you have if you have a like cervical radiculopathy, right, or like a slip disc pressing on a nerve in your spine, and that nerve goes to the biceps, you can have even if it happened years ago, you can have evidence of denervation in the in that muscle. So there's, there's a variety of reasons why you have other things going on. Yeah. Is there any link between ALS, IBM, and Alzheimer's? So that, that one thing I showed you, that VCP protein, that thing seems to be involved in all of those disease, disease processes in one way or another. Will that be addressed in some way? So, um, but the thing is, people with IBM don't usually get Alzheimer's disease. They're not, as far as we know, not at, at increased risk for it. So we, don't, we still don't understand that. We don't, but we, we feel like, what we, what we know is all of those diseases have protein misfolding and things as a part of it, but, but we don't really have a clear understanding of how they're all linked together. Doctor? Yes, sir. Uh, guys, that's the uh, end of the time you know, for the question and answers. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, thank you very much. Sure. For, this was extremely valuable. So thank you for that.